here is Mike Langford. Welcome to another episode of the So Fine Podcast, part of the Fincer Marketing Podcast Network. This week on the show, I have Henry Yoshida, the CEO and co-founder of Rocket Dollar, based right here in Austin, Texas. And here's the deal with Henry. Uh, he's one of my favorite Austin-based entrepreneurs. I've known Henry for I think like six years, or it's got to be over six years now, because he and uh, one of his prior founders demoed their startup at the very first SoFi Net South by Southwest. It was called Honest Dollar, and uh, that startup was acquired by Goldman Sachs not too long after they demoed at SoFi. And I'd like to think we had a little something to do with it. I don't know if we had anything to do with it, but it was great to have them demo at that first one. And then Henry has been a longtime supporter of the event. He supported the event via sponsorship a couple of times. He's connected us with really great entrepreneurs to have them demo at SoFine. And he's connected us with sponsors for the event and so forth. So he's just been a really great advocate for the in-person event that we have each year at South by Southwest. And also Henry, as you'll hear, is also very active in the startup community here in Austin, particularly on the fintech side helping lots of startups either as an investor or an advisor or just a great connector. So I'm a huge fan of Henry's and I'm really excited to shine a light on Rocket Dollar for you. You're going to love this startup. If you know, if you've ever thought about investing in a startup or a small business locally either for yourself or somebody you know is starting a, a restaurant or uh, some other type of business, or they want to invest in, in in real estate, and they're looking for investors to help buy a piece of property or whatever that thing is. But you're like, hey, look, I'd I'd invest, but all of my investment capital is tied up in my IRA. I don't have, you know, fifty grand lying around or twenty grand lying around, whatever the amount of money that you might want to invest in that uh, business is. Well, Henry and the Rocket Dollar team have solved that by making it possible to use those retirement assets for small business investing. So non-security investing. So not stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, right? Or insurance products. You can actually invest in real businesses or crypto and so forth. And so Henry's going to tell you a lot more about it in detail, but you're going to love this episode. I promise. Before we dive in with Henry, make sure you swing by the Advisor Financing Forum podcast presented by Skyview Partners in which we have a special treat for you. Scott Wetzel, the CEO of Skyview Partners, and I are joined by Tommy Joe Martins, the driver of the number 44 NASCAR Xfinity Series Camaro. And Tommy Joe takes us behind the scenes of what it's like to be a NASCAR driver, what's it like to go get sponsorship and, and, and build a team and compete against teams that have you know 5X the budget you have and all sorts of cool stuff like that. And we kind of, you know, just have a little fun conversation, but it was really, really interesting. And we did draw some parallels and some learnings for the wealth management industry. And what's really interesting is I had actually done an episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast by Truelytics a couple of months ago, in which I made the parallels between elite and its successful racing teams and what it takes to have a successful wealth management financial advisory business. And that episode came about because I've been watching a absolute shit ton of racing during this pandemic quarantine type stuff. I've been watching live races, you know, NASCAR stuff. I've watched F1 stuff. I've watched a lot of the documentary series and so forth on Netflix and Amazon and, and wherever I could just start watching racing. I was watching old, you know, uh, uh NHRA dragster races on, uh, Hulu and stuff like that. So I was just having a really good time with it. And sure enough, like a few days later, after I recorded that episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast, Skyview announced that they were sponsoring the Martins Motorsports Camaro. And uh, it's kind of like really cool to actually get to uh, hang out and chat it up with a real live NASCAR driver. And I'll tell you what, Tommy could not be more gracious, humble, and engaging. He's just like, really, you're going to absolutely love that dude. So check that out. Also, one last thing before we get to Henry. Make sure you do check out the latest episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast by Truelytics. I have Shauna Mace on the show. She is a consultant coach for RIA firms and independent financial advisors. And 
I've known Shauna for a while, going back to her days working for a large asset management firm. And then she left and started this consultancy. And she had written a blog post recently that caught my eye that I really wanted to shine a light on. It was all about helping firms accelerate their growth to grow big, right? By focusing on some small things to get there. And it's really, really interesting stuff. Shauna and her practice specializes in helping connect the processes for marketing and sales and making sure that they're all working correctly. Because very often when you're growing an RIA firm or you're an independent financial advisor, you haven't necessarily thought through some of the processes that are required in order to achieve some of the growth things you want, uh, growth goals you want to, you want to achieve. So absolutely check out that episode. Okay. No more blabbering on from me. Let's get to it with Henry Yoshida of Rocket Dollar. Well, Henry, buddy, so great to have you on this show. I, I, you know, you're one of my favorite local Austin fintech entrepreneurs. So it's a pleasure to have you on the SoFine podcast. Welcome, buddy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Mike. So I, I thought we'd kick it off with a quick elevator pitch, the classic you know, 60 second elevator pitch for Rocket Dollar so people can get a very high level picture of what it is that you guys have built and, and how it's benefiting investors around the world. Sure. Yeah, that's an easy one. I, I, I try to stick to easy concepts. So at Rocket Dollar, the, the company that we're building, my team and I, we let people take IRAs and old 401ks, keep the tax treatment. But instead of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds in the public markets, we let people invest in private and alternative securities. So that could be real estate, crypto, invest in startups, become an LP in a private fund, and so forth. So that's what we do. I love this idea. And I know you and I have chatted about this before, but I first heard about this concept way back when, it might even have been before Mitt Romney was running for president. It might've been back when I was in Massachusetts and he was running for senator and then eventually governor. And he, it was reported that he had an IRA that had something like over a hundred million dollars in it. And I'm like, how is that possible? Right? Like how you, yeah. <laughs> you picked the right mutual funds, <laughs> but it turns out, you know, back when he was with Bain Capital that he used his IRA to invest in things like real estate and private companies, like you're suggesting there. So why don't, why hadn't prior to rocket dollar, why hadn't this become a more prevalent thing? Well, you know, it goes back to the history, the creation of IRAs, which is now almost as old as we are. But, it, you know, there was an interesting fork in the road where these accounts, when they were codified in the tax codes, the way that it went, the path was that it was understood that it was just basically public market securities that people would go into. And in many cases, for most people, it's mutual funds. So think of how people end up with an IRA in most cases it usually actually ends up getting created by virtue of an old 401k from an employer or company plan. And then you roll it into an IRA so those people can have a little bit more control. So instead of 20 mutual funds, now they can maybe invest in their own mutual funds or some public stocks and bonds themselves. But the rules, when they were written, actually never specifically disallowed any investments that weren't public stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and so forth. So there was always a small group of people that had access to the deals in the first place. And then also, secondly, access to be able to structure the accounts like a Mitt Romney. So you figure that what he might pay his own personal tax advisors and lawyers is at uh, a degree that's much higher than what you and I might pay our bookkeeper or accountant to help us with our own personal stuff. And since it was never disallowed, there's always been this cottage industry. And I like to refer to it. So I'm a the term I use is that it's such a small part of the retirement assets in America of folks doing private deals inside of IRAs that I call it the second cousin of the redheaded stepchild financial <laughs> services. I like that. So I don't even know if it's fair to say it's the redheaded stepchild. It's someone twice removed from that individual. Yeah, yeah. Whoever it may be. And people like Mitt Romney, people like Peter Thiel, who is very famously known as the first investor in Facebook. Uh, also had been making these types of investments as well using IRA accounts. And it's a really smart thing. I mean, you know, look, we, lots of people in America have the ability, right, to invest in other assets that are not just stocks, bonds, mutual funds, right? They can, again, buy a rental property and, and 
and as you mentioned, invest in crypto. A lot of people are doing that type of thing. And then many more people are looking to invest in small businesses, right? Like to somebody's opening a restaurant or somebody is looking to create a new tech startup. They're looking to invest in those things at the the early you know, friends and family round or even at the angel round. Right. Uh, so why not have some favorable tax treatment, especially if you're like, I'm not going to need the proceeds of that money until I'm in my retirement years. Well, and also there, the, all those investments that you mentioned, they, they, they're, they're mostly structured and probably known as high risk. So to be fair, my background is as a financial planner, I mm-hmm. still maintain a CFP. So I have a lot of deference to the rules and, and the risks involved with some of these investments, but they, along with high risk has the potential for high reward. So the way I come at this, my own personal angle is that in America, if you go into investments that have a high potential for high returns, then why not put it into the best vehicle that's efficient for capturing those high returns? So in America, it's actually the opposite. We have a lot of sort of structured mutual funds with predictable, somewhat more predictable returns inside of these tax protected accounts. Yet, as you mentioned, there are millions of people that are doing private investments with just straight taxable cash. And I think it's the opposite. I think we have the, the, the high risk, high return investments exposed to taxes, and then more of the predictable target date type mutual funds inside of IRAs for the most part. So I'm trying to flip that on its head. And clearly, you know, it could be argued that in their own respective ways that Mitt Romney from the Bain Capital days on the East Coast and Peter Thiel on the West Coast uh, with the startup investing are very sophisticated investors and recognize that why not put the high beta, high return potential investments inside of this vehicle. And I'd I'd be remiss to think that they don't just own regular mutual funds, sure. stocks in a, in a traditional brokerage account like anyone else, just probably with a lot more zeros. Yeah, yeah that's right. So what was your big aha moment that led you to make Rocket Dollar a reality? I mean, you just mentioned it. Your background is in financial planning and, and a more traditional financial services career. When did you decide that, you know what, I've got this vision I want to pivot away from that uh, into a more fintech forward approach for now and, and maybe well into the future. Like this is the new Henry. Yeah. Well, a little bit's based on last company and then, of course, my background. So specific in financial services, I've always worked with retirement type of accounts. So I don't call them retirement. I personally refer to them all the time as tax advantaged mm-hmm. accounts. So that's IRAs, 401ks and so forth. And yeah, I learned a lot and it led me into solving a problem with my last company, which was that younger people, let's say like my nephews and nieces who are midway through college, just finishing, looking at securing their first job after college, their first real job, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. and needing a way to be able to start saving for retirement. So that led to the creation of a company called Honest Dollar, which was just mobile app based, put the platform where they spend all their time, which is on their phone make it easy with low barriers to entry, no decision making needed on the investment side and get young people started early in the right type of account because in their case, they might have 30, 40, 50 years of potential tax deferred growth. And then after that company sort of cycled through and went through its life cycle, I came to this other realization that there's actually people that are probably in the middle class to upper middle class side and then below the Mitt Romney's and Peter Thiel wealths of the country that don't really have the ability to do tax advantage investing in these privates, but they were in starting to invest in them. So this is Coinbase with 40 million accounts. This is a lot of people that you and I know personally who are thinking about buying some investment properties. For example, uh, myself, I invest in startups and then thinking that, you know, if these people are already doing this, I could help them basically be much more efficient in the returns that they could generate and keep if they're successful by using IRA type of accounts to shield those investments, to have them inside there. And so the whole point for me was, this is the thesis. So the, I gave you the 60 second elevator pitch, but the real thesis behind it is the why, which was why can't someone for a couple hundred bucks have the same type of account that Mitt Romney and Peter Thiel had probably spent thousands of dollars. Like if I can make it easy and I can make it affordable, then People already are looking for these deals or they're investing in these deals. You know, what my skill set is being able to allow them to do it inside of an account where they could defer the taxes for decades and thus have net better returns. 
Yeah, that's that's really smart, and and it's an interesting thing to think of. And I've always loved that approach when it comes to any industry, where particularly here in financial services, where there are often products and solutions that were once reserved for the white glove set, right? And many of those, for the reason of either the 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 labor involved in doing it, right? So you mentioned when it comes to you know the rocket dollar solution and using tax advantage accounts to invest in alternative investments or non-marketable securities. The reason why that was a pain in the butt was it required a lot of labor, right? Like you mentioned that the tax attorneys and, and, and accountants and so forth to set things up appropriately and do all the accounting. And so now you've made it efficient with technology and we've seen that in other areas as well. So I'm always fascinated by this. So really cool. Yeah. You are... A little fun fact for the audience, you are the first entrepreneur to pitch two separate startups at SoFi and at South by Southwest. So uh, you kind of covered this a little bit, but you know there was, there was an in-between time for you. That makes it sound like I don't stick with an idea, Mike. <laughs> no, you had one successful exit. You started Honest Dollar, right, with Whirly. There was an exit. So you presented at the very first SoFi and at South by Southwest in 2015, down there on South Congress at Docs Motor Works. Really cool. And then three years later, you had Rocket Dollar you're presenting at our latest location at Key Bar over on West 6th Street. Right. But uh, I love that quick pace of innovation, right? That you, you, you started something, you were fortunate enough to where that, that startup produced a relatively quick exit. Not all startups work that way, as most people know. Right. But you didn't just kind of sit there, right? And, and go, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do anything anymore. You were in the mix, but I wonder if you could maybe share some of the the in-between time, because it wasn't like immediately upon exiting Honest Dollar that you were like, here comes Rocket Dollar, right? You were, there was some time in between where I, I don't know, but talk a little bit about that. What, what was it like during that, that time in between before you had the, the idea and made the decision? Yeah. You know, the last company happened so fast and that was the first time that we had raised or I, I had raised outside capital and it opened up a new world, a new sort of realm of individuals to talk to that were really the the financiers behind the fintech space. And the time after the exit, I concentrated on trying to get myself a little bit entrenched into those networks, kind of learning how they got started and where these people came in, because those people found us in our last idea versus us seeking them out. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I realized there was a lot more to that. So after the exit, I didn't know exactly what idea I wanted to run with. As a matter of fact, I'd cycled through several others and we're testing them out. But in the midst of doing that, I was deploying some of my own capital into fintech deals, which then allowed me to sort of, I guess, earn my spot into being in those fintech investor circles. I was just investing my own money in smaller dollar amounts. But what I learned was there was a there was a leverage effect of, you know, investing your own money actually required a lot more guts and, mm -hmm, and taking yeah. risk than maybe investing other people in the form of LP money. And doing that allowed me to both meet the people that finance fintech companies, but also get a real good sense of the landscape and what was starting to, to become hot and then trying to match that back to what I actually know how to do. So I didn't want to come back in and do something that I wasn't at all familiar with, even within financial services. It needed to be in my area of expertise and saw a whole bunch of different ones, the ones that I invested in, which were not in my areas of expertise. And after canvassing and just sort of floating the ideas out, this is the one I realized was big, big segment of the population. So just to tie it all back in, what I started realizing was that there was markedly increased interest in doing private deals, whether it was going into startups in the fintech space or just generally, or alternative new asset classes like crypto mm -hmm. and so forth. And Every single person, what they told me was not for lack of deals and ideas that they wanted to go into. They said it was lack of capital. Then I matched that back to my side where if you account for 401ks and IRAs in America, even in 2016, 17, and 18, those numbers were going from 20 trillion to 25 trillion to 28 trillion. And then given the market so far this year in 2020, maybe tapered off or somewhat down, but that's a large pool of capital, almost none of which, which was actually an any of these private investments, but it's already there and it's already held by individuals. And when I looked at that, what I'd sort of targeted was 65th percentile to 95th percentile of wealth and income in America. Mm -hmm. 
that's a 30 to 50 million person segment of the population that actually controls about 70% to or more of all investable assets held in places like Fidelity, Schwab, and so forth. So it was just a massive market opportunity. And then I thought to myself, you know, I know how to make that Mitt Romney type account available to someone really easily uh, and something they can manage online. So that's what we ran with. I love it. And I wonder, did you encounter part of the incitement about this concept is, you know, you're starting this in, well, 2018 is when you started demoing it and you demoed it at SoFi. And so that means you probably got your, got rolling in 2017. Were people like a little disillusioned still with, with wall street where they're investing in those, you know, the, the stock market, I mean, the stock market was in a bull run at that point in time, but I mean, I've seen it in my experience that there's been, there's a certain segment of the population that's still not all that thrilled with, with Wall Street. And so maybe looking at some alternatives, it, it's opened their eyes to other investment opportunities. Yeah. Uh, well, Wall Street had done, had done a really good job of continuing a bull run, but they also did the simultaneous job of somewhat distancing people from the actual investments that they were in. So think of like the, I guess you could say indexization of investments on Wall Street, where most people, the vast majority of retirement dollars were created by virtue of working for a company, then automatically getting put into the retirement plan, automatically getting put into a target date fund, which was really uh, made up of 20 funds inside of one. And then those may have invested in some indexes, which they may do on an individual basis. So everything, every step I just named right there was another removal of a layer between the investor and the company that they're invested in. Yeah, you know, gone are the times where people thought I own a share of XYZ public company. I can vote for their board of directors. If I think the CEO isn't doing a good job, I will submit a proxy vote to say that they should be fired and so forth. Uh, 20 years later, right from the nineties to just recent past, People didn't have that connection. Young people didn't have that connection um, to the companies anymore. So that's another thing that I saw too. But since it was generally going up, people didn't complain. But they didn't have that personal connection anymore to the company. There wasn't this loyalty. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You just th That is a, a topic that I just heard from founders of another startup. And you know their, their vision was to get the investor more involved in what they're investing in as part of their solution. And I, and I think that's a really important point that you're making here of like, invest in what you understand, invest in what you're passionate about. Don't just put it into some blind funds. And it's not, again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with mutual funds or, or some marketable securities, but it's the, it's the, the notion of if you have a higher level connection of it and you feel more passionate and, and more, intellectually interested in something you're likely to probably do better over time. Yeah, exactly. And, and I just wanted to bring that connection back because that's probably what got most people in our age range interested in investing in the first place was you felt like you were a part of uh, what you invested in. Angel investing to a certain degree does that now you're rooting for your, 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 your founders and the people you're invested in because you, you have the ability to communicate directly with them. You know, no message I'm going to send to Jamie Dimon to pat him on the back about how he's running JP Morgan Chase in, in, a, in a COVID pandemic time is going to yeah. ever get to him. Yeah, despite my attempts, Zuckerberg has not got back to me any, right. any, any, recently. Hey, there's a quick reminder that you can register for the Benzinga FinTech Awards and get a discount by using the code S O F I N V I P. That's right, so fine V I P or listeners of this show. If you remember, Jason Rasnick was on the show last week. He's the founder and CEO of Benzinga. And we had a fantastic conversation about the importance and value of fintech events for startups, for founders, and the, the general ecosystem. And I'm a huge believer in that, as you might imagine, because of the SoFi at South by Southwest event that's spawned this podcast. So do make sure you check that out. And if you have a startup that you're a big fan of, whether it's yours or somebody else's, like, I don't know, Rocket Dollar, make sure you nominate them for an award that you think is appropriate. I know that uh, our 
Friends over at Truelytics are nominated for Best New Product, Best Data Analysis Tool, and Best Wealth Management Software of the Year. So make sure when you're swinging by, you give them a vote in those categories because we love to see uh, companies that are on the FinServe Marketing Podcast Network get some award love from the community. That would be awesome, okay? Okay, back to the conversation with Henry Yoshida of Rocket Dollar. Let's do it. I want to shift gears to something that is, you know, something I'm aware of, and I'm not sure that every listener is aware of, but people who are here in Austin certainly are, is that you're, I'll call it pseudo famous for your networking here in Austin, particularly in fintech circles. And, and I know part of it is based on exactly what you, you were talking about before, that you hit the ground running, rolled up your sleeves and got really involved in the startup ecosystem. Have you always been an active networker and a connector? Because that's one of the other things. It's one thing to be a networker and kind of be out and about, but you do a really good job of connecting people. You, you and I were talking uh, before we started recording about you connecting a couple of entrepreneurs here with some of their early earliest investors. Is that something that's kind of in your DNA or have you had to learn that over time? Well, I wouldn't say it's in my DNA. I think it's just something that I recognized early on in my career, actually going back to college. So before working at Merrill Lynch, which I started in the year 2000, I did spend one year in Washington, D.C. in the world of politics. And you know, what was interesting there was that no one asked the question, uh, where do you work and what do you do? They actually asked, who do you work for? Uh, because most hmm. individuals in Washington, D.C. work for an individual. And the way they found those opportunities was someone so had a certain skill set, it could benefit XYZ individual staff as a subject matter expert in this field. And that's how you ended up getting a job for XYZ politician uh, and so forth. So I just learned at that time that there was a lot of benefit in, in developing an ability to connect dots uh, between individuals or between skill sets and needs that are out there. And it's just something that's kind of stuck with me ever since. I don't know that I try to purposely seek out meeting people. As a matter of fact, I consider myself kind of a private person that doesn't go out too much. But I do you know, actively in my mind think about, hey, this person could help. Uh, I came across an individual who has a problem. I don't know how to solve this problem myself because there's a limitation of mine where I don't particularly think I'm good at solving a lot of people's problems. But I usually am pretty good at finding someone who might know the answer uh, to those problems or questions. Very interesting. And it's, it's so interesting that you point out the, you know, at, at Washington, D.C., sounds a lot like Hollywood, right? Who do you know type of deal? Who do you work for? But it, what's really interesting about it, it, it is, I, I'm always reminding myself that businesses are just people, right? And, mm -hmm. and if you know people and you know how to interact with people, you know how to help other people, it's, it's going to make business a lot easier. How did your network and again, name recognition, particularly here in Austin and in, in those fintech and, and early stage investment circles, uh, how did that help you get Rocket Dollar off the ground? Was it, was it beneficial, I assume? It, it was because I only, I knew the high level concept. I still needed someone to, it, it was difficult for me to find a product and technology focused co-founder in, in developing the business that had a grounding in financial services but also can think of the framework for how we would build this. I mean, at the end of the day, and, and you know this, the, the times I've pitched both publicly and in front of uh, your groups too, I've never really touted that we have this sort of secret black box that does everything for them from a technology space. We're very clear in communicating that it's a technology enabled workflow. We're taking the manual pieces out of being able to create and structure these types of accounts and manage them ongoing. And the way that I met my technical co-founder, Rick, uh, it, it's written as dude. So a lot of people call him dude. And they think it's the, our version of a John Doe that we created, but his name is Rick Dude. And uh, By the way, the greatest name ever. Like if I had to come back and be like rename something, I kind of want to be Rick Dude. or something. Like, it's just great. I love it. Well, and I'll tell you a little story about that in a second. But uh, we originally met. He was building a robo-advisor before... I'd ever come up with the concept for Honest Dollar. And okay. I did mentor sessions with him and his old co-founder in helping him sort of think through that business model. So 
we were part of this group that was really thinking about digital wealth management and the robo advisor space and what clearing and custody, what regulatory hurdles there would be. And so we had had a number of sessions going all the way back to like, you know, the, the 2011, 12, 13 timeframe. So this is pre honest dollar. And when the time was right, you know, I came to him and said, you know, remember all those hurdles that we used to talk about that you could develop this platform called Rocket Dollar. And we solved the bigger problem, I think, in the fintech space is that we're serving a customer segment that is large, that actually has a lot of money and is willing to pay. You know, many fintechs are there to make a complex financial product or an expensive financial product accessible to a very sort of young and not so affluent demographic. What we thought about was that we're bringing the one at the Peter Thiel Mitt Romney level to basically uh, middle and upper middle class segment, the group that still is willing to pay. And so communicating with him and really fleshing out the idea, but but the willingness and sort of opportunity that was created through the ecosystems locally uh, via Techstars and Capital Factory and others was actually how I met Rick. So it's a real testament to not not me at all, but I would say the openness of our community and the reason why people around the country and around the world now are starting to recognize and move here. Uh, everyone from Elon Musk and Tesla down to, you know, exited entrepreneurs that are looking at the second chapter or the next chapter here in our town coming from the coast. It's, it's you know, by the way, yeah, that news just dropped yesterday officially for anybody who's listening to the show that Tesla is building a huge factory here, a billion dollar plus factory to build the Cybertruck here in Austin. And by the way, pickup trucks should be built in Texas, just so you know, I think it's, you know. Just a smart business decision. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's very fitting. But oh, and then I, I told you I'd tell you a little bit about the Rick thing. So when when I built the first website for Rocket Dollar, we had an about us page. But one of the little uh, Easter eggs that we hid on the website was that when you hovered over Rick's page, it would mm -hmm. actually transition to a picture of Jeff Bridges playing the, the dude from the Big dude. Lebowski. I yeah. Love it. I so. Love it. He didn't know that for months, but I think we had it up for the first seven and a half months that it was a hover. You had to hover over his picture and it would switch to Jeff Bridges. So if Jeff Bridges ends up listening to this, we would love to have him as our sort of uh, voiceover person at some point. That would be fantastic. In, in character as the yeah. dude. As the dude. Yeah. Well, and by the way, if I was Rick, I would dress as the dude all the time and just because. Well, he's, <laughs> he's, he's working from home like everyone else. So all of us. He probably is actually, right? Yeah. <laughs> Catch him in his robe. That's exactly. fantastic. You know, uh, before we dive a little more into the team assembly, because I think that's an in incredibly important thing to, to kind of dive into a bit, uh, you hit on something that I think people in the fintech sp space, particularly early stage, should really consider is, you know, you mentioned that a lot of fintech startups, particularly on the retail side, have been developing solutions for people who really don't have a lot of money, right? They, they, it, 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 there's a reason why, and, and, and I think you did a great job at this at Rocket Dollar, there's a reason why some services or some market segments are not being served. It's because they're very difficult to be served and make money at serving them. And that doesn't mean that they are unworthy of financial services uh, of whatever kind you're, you can imagine, whether it's investing, banking, payments, yada, yada. But very often, the reason why nobody has gone after that market segment is it's just incredibly difficult to make money because every client you bring on, you have to service them. And there are minimum service requirements by regulation in many cases at the federal or the state level for your clients. And those meeting those requirements costs money, right? right. And, and, and so I think that's a really important thing to, to, to share here because I think we probably have a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this. Is like, ask yourself, not just why has this not been done and then think of it from a technology perspective, but then think of it from a business perspective. Why has this not been done? Has anybody attempted to do this? Or why are the bigger, bigger companies that are really good at making money, by the way, that's, that's a common misunderstanding about the financial services world is they know how to make money. <laughs> right. And they have endless resources to put at making money in whatever area they think will be profitable. So there is a big question of why have they not looked at that segment? And, and I'm thinking about that for down the road. I mean, I am trying to think about concepts as I constant, constantly do. I mean, of course, I'm, you know, 110% focused on the business that I'm in now. 
And by, by virtue of, of the model and the business that we have, I'm serving this segment, but I do keep an, keep an ear and an eye to ideas that can, that can significantly benefit portions of the population through financial means. And maybe in some small way, I have an ability to affect that and yeah. thinking through those business models as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a, it's, it's just a smart focal point. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I always encourage anybody who's starting a fintech startup, like make sure you have it. And you do because virtue of, of being the, you know, the, the kind of person who came up with the idea here, you know, your background is in financial services. You understand the space. And, and too often I see fintech startups where people who have never really worked in the space and they don't really know it too much. And so there's a lot of surprises headed their way. Let's let's shift back to the team because the team is so important. You mentioned that you know you and Rick had had, had gone back a few years, uh, but how did you go about you know bringing you know, the site? You know Thomas Young and Rick are listed as co-founders. Yeah. How did you go about convincing them? Like, hey guys, this is the idea. Come on board. Let's do this together. Well, in Thomas's case, he was actually working for an, an analog total paper process version of what the types of accounts we offer at Rocket Dollar. But he's young, he's, he's digital marketing savvy. He had developed a workflow process that, that quasi-digitized a lot of this. So if anything, I, I, he deserves a lot of credit for being the person that had really thought through how to digitize some components of this business. And the way that I met him was also by virtue of some of the networking ecosystem here in Austin. So I have a good friend who is our COO. And the way we had met is that we were both angel investors in, in a couple of companies together. So we actually met through the investor meetups for these particular companies. Uh, he's been a very successful angel investor here in town. These are, these are big companies that he's involved in. And he was the one who was mentoring Thomas just for general how to be a startup employee type space and knew Thomas through that channel. And we you know, got, got to talking. I told him what my next idea was and it matched up very closely to what Thomas had been doing in his day-to-day -day job. So uh, I met him and Chris came on uh, as the COO. So he's really functioning as, as just the other me at the company, running operations on the day-to-day -day basis and helping build the business. But I met Thomas uh, through Chris and he had already somewhat digitized the version of, of this product as well. And so all of us, I would say, try to focus in a realm of maybe 65% or more on product management and product development, but then we have different skill sets as well. But the, the part for us to nail this correctly in Rocket Dollar was basically create uh, a seamless way to invest, create, open up these accounts to allow people to go into alternatives. And the one thing that we haven't done is that we don't provide those investments. What we found was that people already found the things that they wanted to do. We just needed to create the platform mostly because none of us knew really how to hire the attorneys that Peter Thiel is using. <laughs> it's well, it's wild how the stars align like that. Sometimes so you, you meet the right person at the right time and you kind of both are noodling on a, uh, a very similar idea and the, the, the backgrounds mash up. So uh, kind of it's kismet, I guess, for you guys with rocket dollar. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So and that's then, how it all came together. Now you also mentioned, you know, you know, filling out the rest of the team and, and, Again, with a fintech startup, it's it, you can't just hire anybody. It's not always easy to find people here in Austin. I imagine. How'd you go about doing that? Right. So you, you had your your kind of your core four there. How'd you go about finding the right people to fill in the pieces? Well, you know, part of that was just being available and being open to introductions and meetings. I mean, that's how we got the engineering staff. So the engineers that are on our staff, where in some cases, they may have been doing some contract work or were working for other startups or other individuals on product on products here in Austin that I knew. A couple of people on our customer service team were folks that I knew going all the way back to my Merrill days as well. So I knew that they had a, a, a big grounded knowledge base in just how tax advantaged accounts worked in general, and then guiding that and getting further expertise in the in the way that these specialized self-directed type accounts work. So it was a pretty easy, seamless transition and someone that I was comfortable working with in the past. So yeah, we have people on our team that I've known going back to 2005. Wow. 
Wow. That's great. I still love that continuity of relationships and it really does help bring on the, the right people. Yeah. Uh, so I think like most startups, you know, it's, it's an adventure, right? It, it's, and you've already talked a little bit about it. What are a few things that you didn't see coming? It could be a curveball, a unexpected hurdle, or just maybe even a pleasant surprise. Anything that you just like, I didn't see that coming. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. I would say we kind of knew it was a curveball. So maybe this is more akin to just going up against someone that you know would be a, a, a very sort of difficult foe, but just having to face it regardless was that we knew that customer acquisition was going to be tough in this mm-hmm. space. I mean, we're asking people to pay us to open an account to go into an investment that they already found. Uh, and that was a pretty foreign concept. I mean, if anything, and this is really weird going back to you and I both starting in financial services that would we have ever imagined a time where effectively free became the most dominant word in the industry. And we're flipping it on its head to where, no, you're paying us to create the account and you're still diligencing your own deal. You're still you know, going into your own investments, sourcing them and, and deciding how to allocate your portfolio. You're paying us for the ability. So the curveball there was really figuring out the value proposition that we could provide for just being that component of it in a world where you know, free was kind of the, the, the dominant theme at this point. And then maybe pleasant surprises are that we're, we're primarily backed by you know, individuals that I've come to know over time in my career, over time you know, in my sort of fintech universe and so forth. So I like that versus having one dominant investor who might you know, be in a position to quasi control or dictate how we run the business without being in the business. Cause I think it's hard to run the business if you're not in it Mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. So that was a pleasant surprise. I like the the support that we have from a small group of a few dozen people that are investors in the company. And that's the part I like a lot. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I guess the normal curveball might be just the general macroeconomic environment uh, has been something that we hadn't expected. (laughs) But, yeah, uh, I think that's a curveball nobody saw coming. I was like, what's the uh, what was the uh, the pitch that uh, there was a there was a famous pitch I can't remember what the, the name of it was a gyro ball. That's right, that was supposed to be coming. It was, and I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. It was a Japanese pitcher that the Red Sox got. This is decade plus ago, probably, okay. and he was supposed to be famous for having this mysterious pitch called the gyro ball. <laughs> it was like a corkscrew type, whatever, some type of thing. And it never really materialized, but it was, a, you know, it's, it's worse than a curveball, apparently. <laughs> well, my favorite, and this is a world of, of digital, it's a digital world now, but my favorite meme is the picture that goes around on the internet every few days of two black swans together. Yeah. So yeah. it's probably a pretty good way to describe just the world in general today. That's um, great. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good one. I, I maybe have to rephrase this question going forward because I think everybody could answer it with, you know, pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And it's mostly just been an adjustment to, you know, how we work and how we were planning on, on growing the business. So I would say that there's a lot of pleasant surprises that have come out of this as, as well related to this. And yeah, what, what really drives me is I, I, we have this connection to our customers. So we, we talk to the clients of rocket dollar quite a bit and they really feel empowered that they're going into deals where they feel like they know the people behind it directly, or that it's a tangible piece of property in an area of the country that they know. So they feel really good about that versus having an index fund that, you know, may have shares in a whole bunch of companies that to them are just big corporate entities and so forth. So that's a, that's a nice part. That, you know, we feel like we're empowering that investor again to go into things that they know and care about. Um, and yeah, are they yeah. trying to make money? Yes, they are. But they're deploying capital that they already have that otherwise would have gone to filling the coffers of, of a giant monolith financial services company that's likely not, you know, economically tied to their geographic area. Yeah, and I like that as kind of a, a, a way to, you know, as we get closer to wrapping this up here, that that's a really good point that I think maybe people who are in our business don't understand is that, listen, financial services broadly is it's necessary and it's not a necessary evil. It is something that makes kind of, as the the song goes, your money makes the world go around. Like without money and and, and properly operating financial services, a lot of the things you take for granted wouldn't work. And just go back to 2008 when the system was on verge of collapse. And I know a lot of people didn't like the way that that shook out. However, most firms, and, and especially a firm like 
Rocket Dollar are out there trying to make the world a better place. They're trying to give you better options. They're trying to give you access to better investments that even if you, like you said, you found the deal yourself, allow you to invest assets that you might not have been able to do before, right? You said at the beginning, many people pass up on investing in early stage startups or that restaurant or buying a piece of real estate property because they don't have access to capital. Well, they do have capital. It's just locked in an account uh, that currently doesn't allow them to invest in that. And so if they open up a new account by paying Rocket Dollar, they can now invest in all those other types of investments that might be interested in them. Yeah. And, and you'd be surprised. I mean, we, we get a lot of benefit and a lot of good reviews from clients just because we, we make the effort to help them transition all those old accounts into one spot. So think of your average, maybe 35, 40 year old nowadays, where they may or may, they may have five old retirement plans mm. in different places. And we're helping consolidate these accounts into one. And they may or may not choose to have that uh, money on our platform, but it's in one spot now, so they can move it into their traditional accounts. And we're working on product developments to kind of span the universe inside of one account to be able to do both private and public investments, which to me, I think is how the most sophisticated, successful investors in the world manage their money right now. Yeah, They have a mix of private and public. Yeah, it, absolutely. Any, anytime you go up that wealth uh, hierarchy there and, and, and that successful metrics of, of investors, you're going to see people having a really healthy mix of both private and, and, and public investments. So as we wrap things up here, uh, the question that uh, this show is famous for and SoFine is basically famous for is what is your ask of the listener, right? So everybody who presents at SoFine at South by Southwest and everybody who comes on the show, there's going to be something you want from the listener. What do you want them to do? So what is it that you would like from the listener? Uh, I guess in my case, I'd like people to maybe think with an open mind of how they have their own personal investments aligned. Right now, these tax advantage accounts, your IRAs, your 401ks, are you in kind of the, the, the plain Jane pretty standard investments uh, and not taking advantage of the long-term benefits of deferral in those accounts? And then you find yourself with a couple of, let's say it's digital currency investments, a rental property. Uh, or direct investment into a startup, uh, like my investors who back me, are those in taxable accounts? And maybe think that, is that really the right matrix to think under? Maybe that should be flipped and so forth. So I, I don't even ask people to come to our site at rocketdollar.com and try to get educated and open an account. That's an easy thing for me to do. But I'm really just trying to challenge the, the listener with that contra contrarian question of most people have their their most boring, predictable investments inside of the best structure <laughs> take advantage of high returns and high risk. So another yeah, line yeah. that I'm, I'm pretty famous for, and I make this all the time, is just that, you know, the one thing that stinks about your, your, your great, good and awesome investments are taxes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so forth. And what we try to do is minimize that component of it. I can't control if your investment's going to be a bust, good, great or awesome. But in a certain way, people do now, because of our platform, have the ability to control maybe the tax liabilities associated with those investments. Well, that's perfect. Well, that's, I think that's a great way of closing us out. Well, Henry, I want to thank you very much for coming on the SoFine podcast with me. I've been looking forward to catching up for a long time, and I'm so glad we did today. What's the best way for somebody to follow up with you if they have a question or just want to uh, ask, learn a little bit more about Rocket Dollar? Yeah, so it's pretty rare, but we are a digital fintech startup and we actually have our phone number on the website at <laughs> rocketdollar.com and for those people who'd rather chat we have that capability in the bottom right as well but we do have a phone number and we encourage people to to ask questions of us and determine if one of our accounts or our product and service is right for you and if not you're going to leave knowing a little bit more than you may have known before perfect all right sir well thank you very much for coming on the show it's been a pleasure thanks all right. Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of the So Fine Podcast. And a huge thanks to Henry Yoshida of Rocket Dollar for joining us today. This is a really great conversation. I always enjoy my conversations with Henry. And as you can tell, we have great chemistry. And I'm really surprised this episode didn't go a couple of hours because he and I have had those getting together for coffee or having drinks or grabbing a phone call. And you look down at your watch and you're like, wow, time has flown. So, Really good stuff. I suspect at some point in time, I'll have Henry back on the show to talk about other topics. 
Uh, as he mentioned, he's an active angel investor. Uh, he's very active here in the fintech ecosystem. So I'm sure just kind of by the uh, self-declared charter of this podcast of what we're going to talk about, I'm sure there'll be many topics in which Henry will be able to weigh in on. So uh, looking forward to having him back at some point in time. Do take Henry up on his ask. You know, it's really interesting time uh, for the investment space, right? Uh, the public markets are probably going to be very um, volatile, right? I think if you look at uh, any indicator, we're likely to see a lot of volatility. And that doesn't mean you need to exit the markets, but it, you know, maybe a good idea to start to think about private investments and some maybe non-traditional, non-stock uh, bond mutual fund type of stuff. And as Henry mentioned, maybe consider uh, putting some of your riskier assets that may have a longer time horizon uh, in uh, a tax advantaged account and think about using Rocket Dollar for that. Okay. Uh, before I let you go, make sure you do head on over to the BZ Awards. Benzinga Fintech Awards and give Trulytics a vote. Yes, that's right. Trulytics Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. I'm a host over there on that show as well. And uh, they are nominated for uh, Best New Product, Best Data Analysis Tool, and Best Wealth Management Software of the Year. So three different categories. So do swing on over and make sure you give them a vote. And of course, Register to attend. It's going to be a really cool event and use the SOFINE discount code, S-O-F-I-N-V-I-P, to uh, get some money off for attending that. Okay. Hope you're having a wonderful day. As always, make sure you are wearing your mask. Keep your social distance, particularly when you're out there for your walk, by the way. Make sure when you're passing somebody on the sidewalk, somebody decides to either get off the sidewalk or make some room. And then, of course, my big ask of you be nice to each other, okay? We all need some people being a little nicer to us nowadays. All right, have a good one. We'll see you next time on the So Fine Podcast. See ya, bye. <laughs>